All right, Tuesday night. Glad you could make it. Here we are at the loft on our first Tuesday at the loft, our new home. God's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ever ask and think. According to the power <laughs> that works in us. our king come let's bow at his feet he has done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcomes he has done great things he has done great You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awakened alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. Hey! faithful through every storm you'll be faithful forevermore you will do great things and I know you will do it again for your promises yes and amen you have done great things you will do great You conquered the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God You have done great things great thing hallelujah God above it all hallelujah God unshakable hallelujah you have done great things you've done great things oh hero of heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive you break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance you your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things Draw me to your arms as I 
Jesus said this to his disciples, when you see these things coming to pass, you know, when you see the world in turmoil and you, you hear about the rumors and the, the talk and the power struggles and, and kingdoms rising up and falling down and people in panic and fear, he said this to his disciples. He said, look up for your redemption draws nigh. What he meant, I guess, would be to when you start freaking out as you look at these things, look up, away from them, and realize the Lord knows exactly where you are and what you're doing. And I love the fact that so many of you have caught the vision and you're participating with us in the ministry, presenting the gospel and bringing it to people that we would have never before been able to touch. And for that, we're grateful. We're grateful for those of you that have decided to participate with us in this new journey. Coming for 
to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me. Hallelujah. Coming for to carry me. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Well, if you get there before. to carry me home. You can tell all my friends that I'm coming to. Can't wait. Coming for to carry me home. Here we go. Swing low. Sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Well, I'm sometimes up and sometimes down. Can I get a witness? Coming for to carry me home, but still my soul is heaven bound. Coming for to carry me home, bring it home, swing low, sweet shade. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Coming for to carry me home. Everybody all together now. Coming for to carry me home. He's coming again. He's coming again. It's Tuesday night again, and I am so excited about this study. I'm fired up. I mean, it's a weird one because it's it's about an axe head. <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 6 is where we're going to be looking tonight, verses 1 through 7. I, I, I want to take you back, though, to kind of set it up, to kind of talk about it a little bit first. The year, it was 1996. Arguably, arguably the greatest running back of all time, his name, Walter Payton. They called him Sweetness because he was such a nice guy on the field. He was a part of the... <laughs> amazing world champion and I love them with all my heart the 1985 Chicago Bears Jim McMahon uh, Richard Dent uh, who could ever forget uh, Walter Perry or Richard Perry the, the refrigerator uh, Mike Singletary and of course sweetness Walter Payton in 1996 though some years later he's a volunteer a high school basketball coach for the Hoffman Estates basketball team. In a preseason to get together at the Abruzzo home, it was one of the team captains, the Abruzzo home, he was there with all of the guys on the squad and he was given a talk about leadership and trust. And so what he did to emphasize the point, he handed, he took off his Super Bowl ring and handed 
to one of the Abruzzo kids who are part of that squad and had him pass it around and actually had him hang on to it for a day until the practice the next day. And it, it, this illustration of this ring uh, was powerful to say the least, but then it happened. You're not going to believe this, but somebody lost Sweetness's ring. The police were called and everybody was questioned and they looked everywhere. Suspicions were high and the guilt was through the roof. More on that story in a second. But here I'm going to ask you a question. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Or how can you possibly get back that what you've lost when you don't know where to find it? And, and how do you get it back to the way it was before you lost it? Listen, there are millions of possibilities and millions of things that try to tie themselves to our lives, not only our failures, but uh, some of our you know, incredible boneheaded decisions. But I want to bring to you tonight a thought, and the thought is this, with God, all things are possible. That's Luke chapter 1 and verse 37. I'll say it again. With God, all things are possible. Uh, these comes from uh, the book of Luke where the angel Gabriel is talking to Mary and telling her what is about to happen. And she's like baffled and she says, how can this be? And, and that was the answer. With God, all things are possible. Elijah asks Elisha, what would you like to do, with, do for me? Or what would you like me to do for you before I go? And Elijah responds to Elijah and says, give me a double portion of your spirit. And, and the way it worked out, Elijah, he's been known to perform 14 miracles. But Elisha, he did 28 miracles, a double portion. But listen, there's more to it than just miracles. There's wisdom, there's knowledge, there's vision, there's understanding, there's direction, there's discernment. And when you live uh, somewhere around 845 BC and you're in the Middle East, knowing the prophet of God was as good as having the word of God alive, living and walking with you, directing your life with all of that knowledge, wisdom, vision, and understanding and direction and discernment, all of it came with him. And before we head in, let's head up. God, would you bless this, our Bible study, in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to pick it up, 2 Kings 6, verse 1, and I'll read it. Here we go. And the sons of the prophets said to Elijah, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan. Let every man take a beam from there, and let us make uh, there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, said, Go! Elijah, he's uh, realizing, now he's the dean of students for a Bible college, you could call it a seminary, it was, a, it was kind of a, a prophet school, uh, but all the prophets were coming and things were on and cracking, I'll bet you they had a waiting list, they were in capacity, they're out of room, and they're most likely, they're working toward expanding that ministry and that work, and so they came up with a building project, so they asked him, Elijah, what do you think? And Elijah's like, let's build. So... In verse 3, then one of them said, please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. This is a brilliant move by one of these young seminarians. Because when you're in the midst of a building project, I think the smart thing to do when you're around 845, 846 BC is to bring the prophet with you that you might have knowledge and wisdom and vision, understanding, direction, discernment. Remember what I've told you so many times, and maybe you haven't heard it before, but Psalm 127 verse 1 says this, Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And unless, listen to this, unless the Lord God's, guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. In other words, if God isn't going to do it, it's not going to make it. Naturally, in verse 4, so he went down with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Now, I want you to keep in mind that all axe heads are not the same, and I know it sounds a little silly in our day and age, but this is an indispensable tool, and it was very, very valuable. Iron axe heads back in that time were incredibly expensive. 
There's no compensation for the loss. And I take you back to Walter's ring. Nobody found the ring, and, and it's irreplaceable. It's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Note what the man who loses the axe head says when it goes bloop right into the water. He says, alas, master, for it was borrowed. In other words, it's not mine. <laughs> alas, let me just say, it, it's better. Alas sounds a little Shakespearean, but I think in more he was like, Oh my gosh, no way. I mean, there's all kinds of passion behind what he was saying. In Proverbs 22, the second half of verse 7 says, the borrower becomes the slave of the lender. And, and everyone within earshot who heard him scream and maybe watched that plunk go into the water knew that this guy was cooked. I mean, he was done. His life in a moment changed from for the worst, for the incredibly worst, he, he, his, he's going to now have to pay back every bit of what was lost. He's got to make it up, and he's got to cover the cost of the axe head, but he's a young Bible college student. I mean, how's that going to happen? And I know you talk to Jesus. I mean, as people have talked about this story, I've heard so many people say, well, do you think it's legend or do you think it's true? Do you think he really dropped an axe head? Listen, if you were to ask a Jew that very question, you know what their response would be? It is legend and it's true. In other words, it's legend and I believe it. And the reason why they see it this way is because they know that God does nothing without intention, without incredibly meaning, without incredible meaning. This, this story is rife with meaning. God is always reaching and always trying to communicate with people. Looking for an ax head in the scriptures, that's what I did. I thought, well, I wonder if there's anything else. Well, there is in Deuteronomy 19 and verse 5. They're talking about two guys working in a field, and if uh, an ax head falls off and hits the other one in the head and kills him, this man can go to a city of refuge for safety because it's kind of like God was establishing a no-fault system. Uh, the cities of refuge in Israel, Golan and Ramoth and Basor on the east side of the Jordan River and Kadesh and Shechem and Hebron on the west, uh, they established these places where somebody could run. With the ax head in the water, no way did he have what he needed to pay for what he'd lost. The miracle man Elijah, Elisha, I'm sorry, the miracle man Elisha comes up with an odd response. He could have made oil, and like he did for that woman, he could have paid for the ax head with abundance of oil, but he didn't do that. I mean, he could have just gone upstream a little ways, parted the Jordan, and got all the college kids into the river basin to try to find the ax head, but he didn't do that either. But look again at verse 6. It's amazing. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. I mean, this is great. The prophet says, take me to the place, the very spot where everything went wrong. And that's the spot where I'm going to make everything right again. I mean, if you're in a tight spot today, I mean, if you're thinking long and hard about what the future holds for you, and maybe you're, you're a bit into panic mode here, I want you to see what we're looking at here. Most of us want deliverance from that place where the anxiety is, like a Bible college student who drops an expensive item into the water or a young football player who loses Walter Payton's Super Bowl ring. You, you just want to run. You just want to go to a city of refuge and hide. See, but with God, when you factor him into the equation of your, your thinking, he doesn't deliver you from the spot. He delivers you at the spot. <laughs> That's powerful. He doesn't deliver you from your issue. He delivers you at the point of your issue. Look at verse 6 again. So Elisha, he cuts off a stick and he threw it in there and he made the iron float. Now I think this is just bizarre beyond bizarre. I mean, why cut off a stick? Could he be pointing to the cross? Could it be some sort of uh, thing that somebody had? Listen, God always responds by faith. Matter of fact, Hebrews says, by faith, it is impossible to please him. He, you got to come to him by faith. 
And, and the whole point was, I think Elisha needed to join in the process of trusting and believing. So he cuts off the stick. And either way we look at it, it's not about the stick. I wish we were in a room because I'd get you all to say, it's not about the stick. Yeah, God made the impossible happen at the very spot where all the drama erupted. The very spot where the drama came from, God made the impossible happen happen. I want to go back to Luke chapter 1, verse 37, coming from the mouth of Gabriel right into the ears of Mary, and he proclaims this truth, for with God, nothing will be impossible. I like that. I mean, it's one thing to say, with God, all things are possible, but that's not what he's saying here. He's saying, with God, nothing will be impossible. What am I saying to you? I don't care what your spot is. It, it can be incredibly tough. You might be looking at a death sentence for all I know. I just know this. When I heard Gabriel say to Mary, with God, nothing will be impossible, that's taking it to a whole new level. So you might ask, seriously, God cares about lost axe heads? No, he doesn't care about lost axe heads per se. He cares about slavery. He cares about slavery of any type. He cares about your slavery, regardless of what it is. And you know as well as I do, slavery comes in all shapes and sizes, doesn't it? See, he cares about oppression. He cares about the oppression of addiction or resentment or de depression or obsession or resentments or anger or fear or bitterness or rage. He cares about that kind of oppression. And if you've ever been oppressed by those issues even in your own life, how about the oppression of debt? He cares about the fact that you're in debt and he wants to take you to the point of the drama and he wants to do the impossible with you if you're crazy enough, <laughs> if you're brave enough, if you're faith-filled enough to trust him. Check it out, verse 7. This is where we pick it up. Therefore, he said, Pick it, isn't that amazing? Pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and he took, Pick it up for yourself. You get it. I, I would be like, Elijah, why don't you hand it to me? But Elijah wasn't going to hand it to him. He had to reach out. Listen to this. This is powerful. He had to reach out and take it himself. Restoration is available to anybody. It's available to anyone and everyone. All you have to do is you have to reach out by faith and grab it yourself. You have to pick it up yourself. I want you to remember the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, verses 29 and 30. I'll read it. You listen. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's basically saying, take up that new journey in your life. Take up the life of faith. And then in Matthew chapter 16, in verse 24, Jesus told his disciples this. He said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him, there we go again, take up his cross and follow me. See, the first thing is, God cares. He cares about you. God cares about you. And that's why he's saying, you've been serving the wrong master. I will lead you into paths of life, but you've got to reach out and take it. Second point, God loves. Say it with me, God loves. God doesn't play the blame game. He doesn't have to. I get that God is a judgment God. I mean, he's a God of judgment, but the priority here, even in this story, can you see it behind the scenes? It's about God restoring, and it's about... Uh, God blessing and lifting. It's about restoration, not retribution. He's not trying to pay us back for all of the evil things we've ever done. I'll never forget those words from uh, Jesus in Luke chapter 4 in verse 18 where he stood up quoting Isaiah and saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news, to the poor. 
He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. And check out these last few words of Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. To set at liberty those who are oppressed for the slaves, to set you free. God cares. God loves. Third thing before we go, God invites. Yeah, God invites you to see life from his perspective. As you begin to take up that life of faith, you take up your cross and follow him. You deny yourself and simply ask for direction from the word of God, just like inviting Elisha to walk with you. As soon as that happens, you begin to see life like God sees. And by the way, when you begin to see life as God sees life, you begin to live like God lives. Let's go back to Walter for a second. Walter was a superstar athlete. He could have ruined the Abruzzo's life. He could have brought a lawsuit. They lost it, and Walter trusted them with it. They were conceivably on the hook, as I said before, for hundreds of thousands of dollars. But one thing, Walter was a believer. He actually believed, don't worry about it, God's going to work it out. You know what he did after that? He went out and paid for, he went out and bought a replacement ring for himself. See, he, he wanted to leave one of those rings to, to his kids, to one of his two children. And he agonized over that. And in 1999, Walter Payton died of cancer. And, and, and he never saw the end of that story. As providence would have it, two years after the loss of the ring, the Abruzzos moved and unloaded some of their used furniture. A family friend and a college student, Phil Hong was his name, bought the couch and a few other items from the, from the Bruso home for the dorm that he was going to be attending at school. Jump forward five years from that, seven years later, after four moves and eventually uh, now in Texas, Phil still had, <laughs> Phil still had the old couch from the Abruzzo's house. And while he was playing with a tennis ball with his dog back and forth, he was playing fetch in the living room. The ball went under the couch and the dog couldn't get to it. And that's when he kind of got down on his knees and began to reach down for the ball. And he noticed a bulge in the liner of the couch. And that's when it happened. He discovered Walter Payton's 1985 Super Bowl ring. It had his name on it. I mean, how could you miss it? Because he was from a Chicago and he was a Peyton fan from day one, he tried to get a hold of the family, he eventually did get a hold of the family, and he returned the ring to the family. Now check this out. Walter only had two kids, and he was stuck with one ring and two kids. Wouldn't you know it, now he's got a ring for each of his kids. See, God, he sees you, and he loves you, and he cares about you. And he wants to finish that which you couldn't. See, when he sees the homeless, he doesn't see a bunch of losers who have lost it. When he sees somebody incarcerated, he doesn't see just pure evil and we need to keep them in cages. When he sees the chronically ill, he doesn't say, your diet should have been better or you should have lived a better life. He doesn't see the people who suffer with addiction as some sort of weak, need, you know, namby-pamby kind of people. He doesn't see people with all kinds of issues and he doesn't point an accusing finger their way. He sees people that have been made in his image. You are not the worst thing that ever happened to you. And you don't have to have the worst things that have ever been done to you or happened to you be chained to you for the rest of your life. Whatever the reason is, God loves you and sent his son to die for you and holds you trapped between the water and the ax head. What holds you there? Give it up. Whatever it is that holds you there, give it up, take up your cross, and look at God when it comes back and it wants to revisit your life. Say to it, it's not mine, it's yours, God. 
That's all you have to say. It's not mine anymore. It's not my addiction anymore. It's not my sickness anymore. It's not my debt anymore. God, it belongs to you. Lord, I give it to you. It's not my dead relationship. It's not my dead marriage. It's yours, Lord. I give you my relationship, my marriage. It's not my addiction or my obsession or my bitterness or my anger, my resentments. They're not mine anymore. They're not mine. I give them to you no matter what you've lost. God wants to rescue and restore your life. Luke 19, 10, and this is where I leave you. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. God bless you. Run with it, own it, and then give it to him. In Jesus' name, I'll see you next week. Coming for to carry me home. Sweet chariot coming for to carry.